Hello, Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection, Series 14, Program 12. Several series ago, we made platter purses, so-called because the pattern was actually just a tracing around a platter. You demanded more of these and a pattern to use. We can do that. Here are a whole new crop of ideas. Those that you've seen previously on Series 8 is where we made the platter purses are these, and by now they're looking a little over the hill. They're shop-worn because they are very useful little uh, bags, and they have been used a lot. There are about three different varieties here, but let me show you what those varieties are on the new ones that you haven't seen yet. These are over here. Here's the pattern for them, and they're just grouped the same as the picture on the pattern. And down here in the corner, we have something that maybe you've seen before on my program because the fabric I've wrinkled before several series ago. I wrinkled this fabric, and after it was wrinkled, I uh, stitched metallic threads all over it and uh, let nothing go to waste in my stash, so I thought I'd use those scraps and make a little bag out of them. Actually, it's cotton fabric, but by the time you get all the metallics on, it looks like a silk bag, so it could look like a dressy little one. Basically, these are dressy bags because not much is going to fit in these. They're small, and so they typically would be dress bags. But there's nothing sacred about this size. There's no reason why you can't enlarge it and make a bigger one if that would be more useful for you. Another one you saw the beginnings of last series when I was working with uh, fusibles, I think, but I fused all these velvet ribbons on. And once I had them fused to some fleece, I thought, let's use that. So what I've done since then is put some decorative stitches here between the ribbons just to cover over the edges of them and uh, made it into this bag. Now I guess this is a platter and a half since we have a half platter inside and the whole platter going around the outside. And uh, just any kind of fabrics you want to mix, any kind of trims on it, it doesn't matter. It is very unlikely that you would either dry clean or wash these, so what mixtures you put really make little difference. Here's another one, the same one that flaps over that way. And on this one, I used a memory card because it was kind of a new one and I wanted to try out some of the fish on it and see how they worked. So that's what this is. Now what's kind of good about this is it's a hard finished fabric. And if you aren't going to be doing anything as far as upkeep, care, or cleaning of it, it's kind of nice to have a hard finished fabric so that it won't pick up any soil and uh, will stay nice new looking. Okay, so that was one grouping. Another grouping I have down here, all zip at the top. And if you're going to put a zipper in, it might be nice to have a pull. This one just came probably from a drapery department, and it's a commercial one that I've attached here uh, to the zipper pull. And also on this one, it's really nothing elaborate, a very quick bag. It was pre-quilted. Uh, lame actually that I have in this. All I've done is make the bag and add those elephants to it. So that makes kind of a fun one. Now this one is definitely fun because uh, these crystal zippers are in. I introduced these, uh, the idea of these crystal zippers last series, but they're very functional, they're very sturdy. Each tooth is a crystal. And I have not only the whole bag that zips open, and of course you might put pretty linings in. Typically what I put inside are the leftovers from a blouse or a dress, and just use those up because it doesn't take very much. It's a small amount of fabric in there. This one has a second zipper on the outside because I just might want to uh, throw my car keys in there or uh, whatever so that I can easily get a hold of them. So there are two zippers here. You can make a whole, if you want a lot of compartments, put a whole line of zippers and put a separate little pocket attached to each zipper and that would work just fine. I also did this one last time, not the bag, but just uh, these because remember that was uh, when I was using some, oh, those telephone uh, sticky things that you use for notes. I was just doodling on them and after I got it through doodling I thought, say, that wouldn't be a bad design idea. And so I put four of my doodle notes here, cut them out of suede, and put them on. Now again, any fabric can be mixed so it doesn't matter. You could mix fabric in with suede or uh, just as you like it. This is also a little commercial pull that you can find in the zipper department. They always have them there or perhaps they have them in with the buttons but they're readily available. And uh, again, leftovers from some blouse that I have on the inside of that one. So there's another grouping. Then the grouping that I probably did more of than any of the rest is this one. And this is where you start out with uh, 
something that looks like this and then the bottom of it folds up and the top of it folds down and you have this little clutch bag. So here's the idea for all these. Very, very quick and easy. In fact, this style is the quickest one and so this one we'll be talking about. Now what's also fun about this is that it affords the opportunity to use every decorative stitch on your machine because if you have one that's pretty new, you probably have a whole lot of those stitches and you don't have enough places to use them, this is a good place. That's what I've done on this one. You can see that I use the same color thread so it blends in so that it isn't colorful. Didn't want it to be, but you could use every different color thread imaginable. But what I've done here is just do a decorative stitch or a different one each time I did a row of stitching. What I did first of all, because if you just do those straight across it might get a little monotonous, what I did first of all was draw two lines and one was this diagonal over here and one was a diagonal that went over here and I used those two lines as the base to make all the stripes. Now think about when you're going to do decorative stitches and cover one line with a new line later. It would be smart to, for instance, start out on this section and make all these stripes first and that is so that when you make this stripe it can cover it. If you aren't exact about where every one of those rows started, this heavy line of hearts is what I did here could cover it up and so that was a good idea. Then you do all these and then you'd want to cover that up also. So here's another row that covers it up before I did those down at the bottom. So kind of think through in advance how you're going to do this and you might start on what does not show. You might start down here somewhere on most of these bags because it's going to be covered up by the flap if you just need to practice or better yet practice on another scrap of fabric. Just because I happen to have buttons in about the same color, I put a few of them here. They don't function at all. Any of these little bags I'm showing you now also have a little cord around the outside just for a commercial, a finished look. And without that cord, it just doesn't look nearly as flat and nearly as professional. So these cords are easily accessible in any of the notions departments or some Sometimes in the drapery trims, uh, one place or the other, you can find them. Another one that I have here, very similar. Think about a wedding. Do you have one coming up? Do you have about a half dozen bridesmaids to uh, maybe give gifts to or maybe to carry a flower on these? You can mass produce easily a half dozen of these in an afternoon. And so that might be a very quick and inexpensive gift or a usable part of the wedding uh, wardrobe. What this is, is all pin tucking, just twin needle pin tucking. Uh, you use a double needle and you also use a pin tuck foot and that's the one with the little groove on the bottom side of it and what that pin tuck foot does is allow all these little tucks to come up inside the foot so that it does give a third dimension there and uh, this one also I started out by drawing one line I drew a Z like this and after I had that one Z line, then I just did all the others parallel. And when I got on this side of the line, I somehow veered off and started in diamonds and a few other shapes just to, again, break the monotony, give it a little more interest and do something very, very easy. All these rows are just running parallel with each other. So once you have one row stitched, you simply use the edge of the presser foot and put it up against the row that you've already done and it just makes nice parallel rows. Uh, now you can do a lot of beading by machine depending on what beads you have. Sometimes it's just as quick to do them by hand and especially these were uh, done by hand. I think I have about one movie's worth here uh, as I was uh, watching and putting the beads on because I didn't want them touching each other in a line. I wanted them all separate, just a bead here and there and so on. I put the big beads on first and then scattered the little ones around. Again, just to give it a little bit more commercial look, a little bit more interest. So something very simple everybody can do. Everybody can do these successfully and I like the idea that they are very, very simple to do. Well, this one was fun. I uh, picked as I left someplace, you know, I, I've been telling you I've been traveling a lot. I stooped over and picked up a forget-me-not someplace, but I forgot where. I don't know where it was, but anyway, when I did this bag, I started out with a three-step, uh, the forward and backward, the three-stitch uh, zip 
stretch stitch is what it is. And so it goes forward and back and keeps going forward a little more each time. But just so that it would be a heavier stem, that's what I made all the stems out of first when I was embroidering this one. And then after I had the stems on, I did these flowers. And what's fun about these flowers is the fact that you do them, you place them in the hoop, and it does four of them at a time. Here you can see I did four of them here. And then uh, without moving the hoop, you can just push the right buttons on the machine and make it move over, as I've done here on a practice first, and uh, do some more. And just completely fill up that hoop before you move it at all, so that makes it fast. Here I've just started one, it's still in the hoop, but you can see how it can be moved all over to have that done to it. Uh, this one also, a cord around the edge just to make it look very nice. Now all of these would be appropriate for holidays, for dressy, for weddings, and all of them are the same. They are uh, that heavy, very heavy fabric, but also it's a hard finish, so it won't soil easily, it won't show anything. And uh, these all Velcro again. Another one that I made out of wool, and of course it's not going to so, uh, show any soil being black, uh, just what I happen to have at hand, and also to show any fabric will do. It doesn't matter what it is you use to make these. And what I've done on this is embroider from a big embroidery card. Big flowers uh, are on this. So this one I just showed you recently. Um, doing it another way. I was doing some flowers on another project, but they are uh, just really pretty to do in whatever color. Metallics in this case, because it's striking, it really shows up. And uh, those are all that are in the pattern, but then I keep on making them. Here I was using just the automatic quilting that's on one of the memory cards, and so this was done in a couple of minutes. Uh, without my help, the machine did it. Here's another one that I had a little bit of this wrinkled fabric, shibori is what it is actually. And uh, this I stretched out, fused to the fleece backing, and then just stitched some of this suede on it. Well, I stitched, stitched that suede around the edge because I really didn't have quite enough fabric. It didn't cover completely. And so it's always nice to mix fabrics if you need something extra. And the fact that I stitched this suede on, it looks a lot nicer by doing so. Now this suede that I have stitched on here is nothing elaborate at all. It was just simply a matter of making just straight cut in here right along the edge. I would just make a little slash there and then those slashes as they're stitched on you can curve this suede around and stitching it on the bag. You don't have to fuse it. It's just simply a matter of pulling it around here and there as you stitch and it's just very very easy to do. All these things are attainable. This is one I have a jacket in series 9 I wore this jacket and this was simply a scrap left over. What I've done to this is embellish it slightly by uh, putting a cord, a little purple cord here, to turn the silver a little purpley because I wanted to use those pretty buttons on it. And so I thought they would go a lot better if I would put a little purple in the bag also. So they're very easy. There is nothing to them and let me show you what's in the pattern and what are the steps in order to get this done. Uh, those that I have over here, here's the one that both zips. If you put a zipper, you'd put it here at the fold at the top. If it has the flap, you would just flap it over like this and do another half bag here to put inside. Or this would be the shape of the one that rolls that is uh, in three different sections. And this is the one I've done most of those with. Well, you can see that doesn't take very much fabric. If I put it down on my cutting mat here, I see this one is only 16 inches long and it is about, um, how much is that? Way down there. Okay, I'm at the wrong end of the mat to tell you. Uh, it's about 12 inches wide, 13 inches wide, something like that. You can always make it bigger though if you prefer. And so all you need for this is four layers of fabric or four layers of whatever you use. Uh, one layer, these are the two inside layers of course because they're not very pretty, but this is the layer that backs the fashion fabric. This will be the outside of the bag. And what this is is some fusible fleece. Uh, maybe you see a little bit of shine on this side, that's the fusible material. And of course it melts when you press it and it then fuses itself to the fabric that you're using, the back side of that fabric. So there's one layer that you're going to have to have for any of these bags, no matter which. 
Another layer is just some heavy duty interfacing. This is fusible also. And this is going to go against the lining. Now usually when you use interfacing on a lining, it would be some sheer weight. It would be a very light weight because you really wouldn't want to beef it up much. But you break the rules when you do things like this. I wouldn't use this fusible fleece on a garment, probably on an article of clothing, because it would be too stiff. It would stiffen it too much, and I'd rather keep it softer. I only use this on projects such as these little bags or belts, uh, because it's suitable there. But here you can see on this fabric, which will be the lining half of it, that I do have that heavy interfacing, and it isn't that stiff, but it does strengthen it, and you really do need those two layers on the inside. Then, of course, the outside is going to be the fashion fabric on the fleece and the lining on the interfacing. So you first of all fuse. Now, did you notice when I had this open that the only layer that I actually have cut out at all is the fleece layer? It's cut in that U shape, and the rest of it, it's easier if you don't because when you stitch it together, you don't have to be exact about it if you don't have anything else cut out. You can instead just fold it like this, stitch around the edge, and as long as you can see the outline of that fleece, that's all you need. And then you cut it out and it makes it a lot uh, simpler to get a perfect job. Well, what you would usually do first is whatever embellishment you want after you fuse it. Here's one that I just finished. I used some Australian flowers here. But first of all, I fused the fleece on the back and then put it in the hoop and did these automatically. I haven't pressed this since I stitched it so you can still see the hoop shapes. One is around here and one's around here and the other one's here. So you can see I did two of them sideways and one of them lengthwise. And because of that, uh, I got them to fit just where I wanted them to. And, uh, worked out just fine. Now that's how I would do most of these. I would put the fleece on and embellish them and then make the bag later. Now here I was actually building the fabric. I did this a few, um, a few programs ago and this is where I was just uh, playing with a wave blade on uh, the Fisker's cutter and uh, making all these nice little scallops and I had such fun I couldn't stop. And so that's where all these came from, and some of them are wider on one end or the other, and that's why they fan around this way. And then I have fused the fleece to the back side of it. All I need to do now is trim off the extra, but there's no reason to do it now, really. Uh, you can if you want to, but you're doing the job twice, because after you stitch this on to the lining, you're gonna have to cut around there anyway. And so probably you'll wait and do it later. But you can see anything will make a gorgeous bag, any little scraps you have. The only time that you would first of all do something to that fashion fabric before you fuse it on the fleece is if you're going to texture it in some way. For instance, this one, I have a lot of pin tucks all along, just little tucks. They get a little bit spacier as they go along. And so this was done first, then it was pressed, and then after you press it flat, then you fuse the fleece to the back side of it. The same would be for any uh, fabric that you wrinkle or texturize in any way. Do that first, fuse second. Okay, and then once you get that done and once you have the backing all put together here, then it's time to go ahead and stitch them together. And all we're going to do, put a couple more pins in here, all we're going to do in order to stitch these, and this one I don't have pressed, but that's okay, I can do it later as I'm turning it so it won't even matter. Uh, on second thought, I have one on the machine, I'll just stitch that one. But here's what we would want to do first. We would want to get it all pinned together, and then we're going to go uh, stitch it. And this is just a simple straight stitch, nothing to it. And uh, on this one that I have down here, I just finished embroidering also, so that has a few more flowers on in a heart shape. That's going to be the flap, by the way, and remember, is this the flap or is this the inside of the bag that won't show? So be sure when you do any of this embellishing that you realize which end you're doing it to. And we want to stitch all the way around here, and it's even a little tough to get the pin through by the time I have uh, all these layers because you want this bag to be stiff and sturdy. Okay, I'm going to stitch all the way around except I want to have a little space open right here. I do not want that closed because we have to turn it right side out some way or other and this is a good way. Now this is just going to be a little narrow seam. You can either use a quarter inch foot or I'm just going to move this over so that it stitches approximately a quarter of an inch. And it's just going to be straight stitch, so I'm on the menu. I better get over to straight stitch. And uh, 
we're ready to go. And I think I'll just backstitch to make sure it holds when it's turned and get the pin out of there. And uh, when I get down to the corner, I would like to have the needle stay down because it's easier to pivot that way. So I'm coming into the corner now and when I get to right where I wanna go, I'll just stop and pivot this and uh, come around the side and do the rest of it. I didn't put very many pins in this. It would have been a good idea probably to pin it more securely, but these are such stiff fabrics that they really, hopefully, <laughs> aren't moving at all. Ah, one pin is all I put in, huh? Okay. Now this also might be easier. Notice how I'm holding this up since I have very few pins. If I had the machine down in the cabinet and if I had the flat bed uh, partition around it, it would hold it uh, a little easier since it would be all nice and flat that way. But this will do. If I seem to be doing this rather carelessly, it's really because you can do no wrong on it. It's just going to be a real easy thing to do. The fact that this is drooping down isn't such a bad idea because I have the fashion fabric on top, I have the lining underneath, and by the time you turn it right side out, the turn of the cloth, you know, when something curves, when it's folded, uh, it isn't a bad idea. This will end up bigger, the lining smaller. So even though I didn't really plan to do it this way, it's working to my advantage to actually do it this way. Now, if I would be making a lot of these, such as for a wedding or such as for Christmas presents, um, I would probably mass produce by doing all of them to one point and then doing all of them to the next point, just because when your mind is in gear and you're used to doing that particular process, it makes it easier if you do it many times. It's quicker in the long run. Think about these also if when uh, fall comes, if you need to donate some items to a bazaar for a club or a church or something, this might be a good donation because it takes such a little bit of fabric. And I have a feeling you just may have a little bit of fabric in your stash that you could use for that. Well, once you have it all stitched except right here, it's going to have to be turned inside out. But first we better cut it. And you can either do that with a rotary blade and a cutting mat to get that uh, nice pinked edge, or you can do it with regular pinking shears. And uh, since I don't have a cutting mat with me, I'll just do it with this. Now, nothing needs to be pinked, actually, except um, around the curve. And that's a good place to pink. The rest of it can be straight cut. And the reason that's a good place to pink is because uh, you want to kind of have little uh, Vs cut out of it. If you use the pinking shears, that'll cut it for you automatically. So I'm just going to cut down to that area, and then I'll pink the curve. And I want to cut off the corners because we don't want them there. And I'm not going to cut off this bottom. I have a little extra here. It's easier to get it inside and to press it nicely if I don't have that bottom cut off. So I'll just cut this much of it and leave the, uh, this straight edge as is just for easier turning and pressing and stitching as we finish up the bag. And since we're down at the curve, then go ahead and do the rest of it with pinking shears so that you can get some of those little V's built into it. And if this is really heavy, this is especially where the rotary uh, pinking uh, blade is very helpful because uh, it doesn't take nearly as much energy to do that. And especially if you have any problems with your hands, be sure that you get one of those rotary blades because they are just great for applying no pressure and getting the job done. Okay, you can see now that we have it all cut out, that it does have that uh, nice little edge there so that it does eliminate some of the bulk and it'll be a lot um, uh, nicer around that curve. All the bulk will go out of it or not be there at all. Okay, I just want to turn these corners and this is nice to have a little turner I love having that cabinet right where it's handy so that I never have to get up, everything's there. But a little point turner like this is good to push those corners out. And uh, once we have those pushed out, then the rest of the bag is going to be simple to turn through and put it through very 
very carefully so you don't poke completely. And uh, once the rest of the bag is turned inside out, we're going to have to press it and then put a cord around the edge. Now, I'm not going to have time to do the whole thing, so I'm just going to, without pressing it, show you how to attach that cord. And uh, this is also a simple process. It's going to be zigzagged in place. But you do want to do a really good press job. What I put on right now, I will just have to take off before I finish it. I'm going to put it on here so that I won't have to ruin anything. Okay, this is simulating the edge of the bag once it is pressed. Once it's pressed, turn those edges in, stitch the top. And it's a good idea for all this to have a monofilament thread in. And then as you do this, and I'll put it on zigzag, if you have monofilament thread, it's just a matter of using it top and bottom, just zigzagging here. And this is going to zigzag so that it, it attaches the bag and the cord together. And you can see it just goes back and forth. So it's very simple to do that. And once you have all that cord on, then it's going to be a trifold. You fold this up, you fold that down, put your fastener on, and you've got a marvelous little bag or a bunch of those marvelous little bags, whatever the case may be. You might then put some beads on or whatever embellishment makes it really super and makes it suitable for the occasion wherever you're going to carry it. Well, let me warn you, making these little bags is addictive. As more ideas constantly come to you and uh, that you just can't stop, they just go on and on. Well, a wardrobe that goes on forever is very nice when everything coordinates with everything else. Sometimes it's just one pivotal piece that orchestrates the whole collection. Join me next time for St. Louis Symphony.